all the time. Let's give a Lord a hand. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being here. I am just thrilled that we can be here together and worship Jesus. We get to sing about Jesus. We get to sing about the blood of Jesus. Amen? It doesn't get any better than that, right? Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Stand with me if you can. Ephesians 1.7. Let's start with the three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace, with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. Now listen to this. We're just saying about it. In Him... We have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. If you are a guest here, thank you for being here. I want to ask you to do something before the end of the service. Take a card in front of you. Fill it out. Give it to me on the way out. I want you to hand it to me so we can just say hello to each other just for a minute, okay? Let's pray. Father, we praise You for the way... Cymbals, 
But when they had come to the threshing floor of Nathan, the Uzzah reached out toward the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen nearly upset it. And the anger of the Lord burned against Uzzah, and God struck him down there for his irreverence, and he died there by the ark of God. David became angry because of the Lord's outburst against Uzzah, and that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. So David was afraid of the Lord that day, and he said, How can the ark of the Lord come to me? And now David was unwilling to move the ark of the Lord into the city of David with uh, with him. But David took, us, took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. Thus the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for just this opportunity. <laughs> experience on Thursday night. I got to see a no-hitter. The only problem was it was the wrong side. It was had the no-hit. But it was uh, it was a great it was a great occasion. I got to go with my sons. We got to enjoy a, a little uh, little baseball action. Got to hear the crack of the bats, at least their bats. Got to <laughs> got to uh, got to hear the roar and the buzz of the crowd. And uh, yeah, I got to even eat a hot mess. Okay, so it was uh, it was a lot of fun and and it was great. And it was about three hours long. You know, baseball games can can go three hours. How many of y'all have ever been to a baseball game before? Yeah, yeah. And I know people get up, they, they go and get the hot dogs, they get up, they use the bathroom and all that stuff, right? But they, they sit there and they enjoy most of the time for for the whole game. Now, I went to the very end, and not because I wanted to see the no-hit, I wanted to see us break the no-hit, okay? So I was cheering us on to try to hit it, but it wouldn't happen, you know, and it was it was okay, it was okay. And I, I did enjoy it, it was great, uh, great game. But you know, how we approach worship, how we approach time with the Lord together as a people of God, we've got something to learn from baseball fans. You know, baseball fans will sit there and go there and be there all the way to the very last pitch. You all see that before? I mean, do you ever see when they go extra innings and they get into 14 innings, right? Get into 14 innings and everybody leaves, right? And then you got a few diehard fans, you know, and they started this, this whoo thing on the, on the, you can hear it on TV now, I can't stand that, but, but they sit there and they're watching the game all the way to the 14th, 15th inning until somebody finally scores a run, you know? Um, and, and that's a diehard fan, but, but we can learn from those fans. 
A few years ago, Jamie and I went to opening day, and that was the day that that was the opening day. If I remember right, that we actually snuck into the opening day parade, right? Yeah. So we we snuck into the parade, and we got became part of the parade, waving to people, and you know, got the, yeah, we did, we did. Seriously, we went in there. We were with the Cincinnati Art Museum people. They didn't know who we were, and we went in there, and we were walking with them. We're waving, we're waving, we're. I'm taking pictures. I got pictures of Jamie just looking back at me as we're going in there. And finally, we get to the end of the lady there with the Cincinnati Army Museum. She said, man, you guys are great. She said, who are you? <laughs> and we said, well, we just wanted to be in a parade. She said, okay, that's fine. We didn't get arrested or anything like that. You didn't see my name in the paper. But we went to a baseball game, and the Reds were losing. Uh, it was a pretty, we were losing pretty bad. And it got to seventh inning, and we had standing room only seats, and then all of a sudden people left. So we got seats way up in the nosebleeds. And then more people left, and we, um, and it was cold, and more people left. More. Finally, we got down near the very front because nobody left, and it was a ninth inning. Never forget that. And it was um, uh, Ramon Hernandez, the catcher, who hit a, a home run and won the game for the Reds. And we were there like, yeah! It paid to be a diehard fan to sit there at the very end. Church, we can learn from some of these diehard fans. Amen? When we're in worship, we should be praising God with joy. We should be sticking it out to see what God's going to do at the very end as people come forward and, re- and receive Christ or rededicate their lives. Or you might not even know what's going on, but you feel the Spirit leading you to just pray for that person. Praise God. That's part of the corporate worship experience. We build one another up. We see it to the very end. That's how worship should look. Now we come to 2 Samuel 6 and we see a guy die in this. Okay, this this is a guy. And we see that he is dead and we say, well, what has that got to do with worship? Well, let me explain. See, David has become king. And all of Israel is in, is in their glory. They're, the land's prosperous. The, the, the enemy's defeated. All the people are united. They're happy. Most of them, at least, are happy. Life is good, right? It's good to be with King David. You know what I mean? And, and, and all these things are happening. But yet, one thing is still incomplete. They've got all these great things happening, but the Ark of the Covenant is in a place that it shouldn't be. It's in a in a uh, the the ha- the house in a place uh, of of uh, in a town of Baal Judah or Kiriath Jerim, and it's it's sitting there, and it's been there for about twenty years. It's been kept safely. It's in the house of Abinadab for 20 years, but it's not in its proper place. It's not complete. And so David, to accomplish his kingship, to accomplish what what achievements he can do, David says, I'm going to fix this. Now, I get that. I'm a fix-it kind of guy, you know? My wife will say I'm feeling something or I'm, I want something or I'm, I'm thinking something and I want to fix it, right? You ever, you ever, guys, you ever know, you know what I'm talking about? Your wives say something and they say, uh, they say to you, uh, they say, okay, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the plumbing's broken, the, the, the kitchen is flooded, and you pull out your, your thing and you're just, okay, let me fix it. Let me take care of it, right? Or they tell you your, their problems and you immediately start to try to solve it for them and, and present the solutions. By the way, if you're a husband, don't ever, don't always do that, okay? Sometimes they just want to tell you, right? But they David is a fix-it guy, and he's trying to fix the problem, and part of it is for his own glory. Part of it is for the glory of the kingship. Now, we know this because tragedy happens, and we know this because the approach changes. But David takes 30,000 people, 30,000, and he he chooses them, and he says, we're going to go worship at this town, Baal, Judah, and and we're going to go to the house of Abinadab, and we're going to bring that ark back to Jerusalem. So they take the ark, as you as you heard read, they put it on a brand new cart with oxen pulling it, right? And they set it out for a place that David has pitched a tent in Jerusalem. It's not the actual tabernacle at that point, but it is a tent. It's a housing for the, the ark in Jerusalem. The problem is it becomes a parade. It, it kind of gets away from, from David a little bit. 
Uh, Ohio and Uzzah are in front. These are the sons of Abinadab, and they're they're driving the oxen. They're close by the cart. Uh, uh, Uzzah is closer to it, obviously. And you've got 30,000 people involved in this whole parade of sorts. Israel's finest. They're celebrating, you know? Now, what about David? Well, David's there watching it, and David is having the time of his life. He is dancing, right? Right? He is, he is celebrating. He is just, in, I can't dance. He is just enjoying himself, right? He is, he is just, he is just, just, just lift, lifting it up. He is just living it up. The house of Israel is, is enjoying themselves. They're playing, you see it on there. They're having a huge party. They're playing tambourines. They're, they're clanging cymbals, right? They're ringing bells. When we see castanets, it's not the clicking Spanish. So we're talking about like sticks with bells on them. They're blowing on trumpets, right? <laughs> right? They're strumming lyres. They're singing songs. They're even dancing up a storm, right? Fine times have come. They're, they're, they're fun. They're having fun here, you know? But as the things are happening, as the parade has begun, and at almost they get to Jerusalem, the music's playing, the people are cheering, David's kind of showing off, all of Israel's taking in this pride of, of this ultimate achievement and accomplishment, the bells are ringing, all that stuff, right? One of the oxen all of a sudden does what? He kind of stumbles things around, right? He kind of he kind of makes the car go ooh right, and Azza, this poor guy, he touches the ark to try to stop it from falling. There's nothing wrong in his mind with what he did, but he touches it, and all of a sudden he's struck dead and he falls over. Silence comes. The music's playing, the bells are ringing, the people are singing, David's dancing, also dies, and everything's quiet. <laughs> the party has stopped. <laughs> they're just, they're, they're just, un- they can't believe it. It's unbelievable. They, are, they have disbelief over what happened. The, the, the party was over. It just stopped. This is a horrible tragedy that took place. And we say, well, what has that got to do with worship? I'll explain. Because the party here, this parade became a celebration of self. It was self-indulgence that took place. It was, it was something that was glorifying self, and it ended tragically in death. It ended tragically with fear and with sadness. Even David was angry at God because he struck down Uzzah. Why? Why would God do this? Why would this happen? Why Why poor Uzzah? Who, what did he ever do to God? Why did he have to die with that? God, why did you burst the bubble at this party? They're just excited, right? But let me just say this. It's not that God approved of this in the first place. You see, the problem wasn't with us, though. The problem was people wide. It was all of Israel. It was David and everybody else. They cared no, not about God and worshiping God and lifting up God. They had a casual, listen, 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 a casual, lackadaisical attitude about worshiping the holiness of God and the worthiness of God. When we worship God, even the word worship means uh, giving God His worth. Saying to God, you are worthy of our praise. You are holy and I am not. You are perfect and I am not. You are great and I am not. You are God, listen, and I am not. And when you are worshiping, you are giving God His worth for ship. What they had was this casual, lackadaisical, uncaring even attitude about worshiping God. It, they really cared more about themselves and about what they were doing 
than God himself. And God takes worship seriously. And when people don't, it grieves him. It takes away from his glory and his majesty. It tramples on his name and his preeminence. It quenches the Holy Spirit and it costs dearly. And it made the worship itself to be an idol instead of the God that they're supposed to worship. Our Western culture is so guilty of being idolatrous in the church. You thought I was going to stop with culture, but I mean the church. We've created for ourselves our own idols. We think experience is greater than the Word of God. We think consumerism is okay. You can go to a church and you can go to this McDonald's, kind of treat them like McDonald's. You go here or you go here, you can have it your way. Tim Keller said this, church is not a mall that a family gives themselves to. It's not about me. It's all about God. Church is an event, is what people think, not a journey to take with others you love. And and God wants us to make it a lifelong journey together. When a church loves each other and loves God, they're going to walk through life together. They're going to have uh, 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 joys together or they're going to have disappointments together. I shared with a a Sunday school class that um, I sat in on, and uh, a friend of mine passed away this, this last week from Maryland. Godly man. Loved the Lord. He, um, he went to another church and him and I got to become really good friends. And he would go to our seminary extension. He would preach on Wednesday nights. And we, I had a rotation of preachers on Wednesday nights so they can, they can grow in their ability to preach. And it, it strengthened his walk in, in Christ to where he ministered effectively at his church as a, as a lay pastor. And, um, and he, um, he, he did not look at um, his, his faith as here today, gone tomorrow. It was an everyday thing. And unfortunately and tragically, he was working, uh, he was a chicken farmer. He had seven chicken houses, 11,000 chickens in each house. 77,000 chickens. Can you imagine that? And he was, I guess he was working on a chicken feeder, and, and if something went wrong, he was electrocuted. This, this family of faith in this little town of, of 3,500, 2,500 people came together, and the church grieved for one another. They, they didn't look at it as McDonald's. They looked at it as, we are here to stay, and we're here forever. And, and church, this is how we must look at each other, that worship together is something we do, but worship is something that we live every day for one another, with one another, for God. And when we don't, it's deadly. This is why Uzzah died, tragically. This is why he was struck down. Because, not because of him, but because of all the people, they took a half-hearted approach to worship. And it's deadly when people think that corporate worship is just an event. Or a way of showing off. It's deadly when, when to apply today when people think that corporate worship is optional. It's not. It's, a, it's an opportunity to worship Jesus. It's deadly when a person's hypocritical and acts holier than thou when they're in church. Because all of us are sinners and fall short of the glory of God. It's deadly when somebody worships and praises God with the same mouth that they curse others with. It's deadly when worship becomes something we go to and something we get to do. Idols are deadly. And it's deadly for the individual and it's very poisonous for others. So when we approach worship as they approach worship with a shallow, ignorant, lackadaisical, and casual uh, approach like that, then that person will have a shallow, shaking, shaking, maybe even temporary faith, and maybe not even have a true faith in Christ. But church, God wants us to be different, amen? He wants us to have joy. He wants us to be zealous. He wants us to be Christ-focused. He wants us to be serious about worship. He wants us to be joyful about worship. He wants us to dance and not care what people say about it. Amen? He wants us to enjoy His presence together. Not because we're so good. It's because we're not good, and He is. And that's the point. 
He wants us to enjoy His presence together with people who also love Him with all their heart, their soul, their mind, and their strength. Paul told Timothy in his discussion on worship in, in 1 Timothy that he wanted to see men with their holy hands lifted up without dissension and wrath. That, 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 that women were to receive instructions rather than interrupt teachings. And, and, and there was supposed to be an organized system of pastors and deacons and, and be disciplined in word to respect and to care for the widows and the orphans and to give honor to the pastor who, who does indeed is called to the church as the under-shepherd. And, and he told them all these things because we are to practice what we preach and we are to do daily what we're supposed to do for an hour or an hour and a half. And when people worry about the length of service, now don't get me wrong, I'm not saying we need to be here until 5 p.m. I'll be starving, okay? But when people worry about the length of service, when they can sit at a ball game for three hours or a movie for two hours or sit in front of their TV all night watching sitcoms, what's wrong with us? We need to be all about worshiping Jesus. Be orderly, passionate, sacrificial, focused, and joyful. This is what worship should look like. So, let me give you some principles related to worship. As you seek to place God first, please write these down. Please meditate on those, and let's give God all of His glory. God wants worship, first of all, to be perfectly ordered. Perfectly ordered. What we see here is David doing something right. He has got an orderly, um, organized kind of worship pattern here. We see it especially as he makes changes. He gathered the people. He chose the people. He gave instructions. He said, you were going to do something special. But the problem was he went with what he was most comfortable with. Now, David was a musician. David loved to play instruments. He wrote half of the Psalms in the Bible. He played music for Saul when he was younger. He, he showed his love for music throughout his life. And, and, and yet this is an issue here because David was, he cared more about the stuff instead of what was inside. I love music. I, I, I'll tell you, when I first started going to seminary, and I went to meet the dean of school music at, um, at Southern Seminary. Lloyd Mims at the time was the dean there. And he said to me, he said, we'd love to have you here. And I was going to go to seminary and be a pastor of worship. That's actually what I was starting to head into. And, and, and you know, God did something in a year that I didn't go to seminary and it really kind of refocused me and shifted me over. And, and I, I realized that's not, that was not what I was called to do. But, you know, I love music. Music, but music can be an idol. You know, uh, when we start saying to one another and to ourselves and, and to a leader, say, oh, why can't we have this music? Man, Pastor, I would love to see a guy grab a guitar and just... Right? Or, Pastor, I want to see somebody get on this thing and just... Da, 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 da. Yeah, whatever, right? When people say that, I worry because you care more about style. You're worshiping something that's that's not supposed to be worshipped. You're supposed to be worshiping God, not the instruments. Amen. Music is part of worship, but music is not to be. Worship itself. Order must have purpose. When we worship, we worship a God of order. When David had set people in place, he had an order of what they were going to do. And and at the time, he thought, okay, they're going to put them on a cart. They're going to go ahead and worship in order. They're going to do this. And so they were playing, and it was it was all kind of a farce. They were saying, yeah, we're worshiping God, but they weren't. God wants worship to be orderly as He is. God made the universe in an orderly fashion. Amen. He, when you look at the Book of Genesis, you say how God made everything, each in its day we have, and you look at our universe, you see we have orbits, the earth rotates, we orbit around the sun, the, the solar systems orbit around the galaxies, the galaxies orbit around and move and stuff, right? It's, it's amazing how how everything is in order. You say, no, I didn't think of it like that. I see the universe, I see things, it's chaotic. It's not chaotic, it's just big. We can't wrap our minds around the, the immensity of our universe, but it doesn't mean it doesn't have order. 
It's that God who is so much bigger than us and so much greater than us can see the order. And when you really sit back and look at it, you say, wow, it does move around perfectly. Wow, our, our cells and our, and our molecules stay together through covalent bonds. That's an amazing thing. Because God is a God of order. He is. He gives us gravity to keep us from floating out to space. He gives us air so we can we can breathe it and it's recirculate it through a filtering system with plants and 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 that's order. So our worship is supposed to be a worship of order. And, and how we worship here at First Baptist Church is it's not style driven. We don't we don't just say, hey, uh, I think we should play a little more of uh, rock and roll this week, or a little more southern gospel this week, or a little more jazz this week. We don't do that. When when I uh, do the outlines for the uh, service, what you see up there and you write down, I have that done usually by Monday, sometimes Tuesday, sometimes Wednesday. And then I get it out to the staff, and, and Harry immediately looks at it. He already knows kind of what I'm going to preach on based on the scriptures, which I put out way ahead of time. But, but he looks at it, and he says, okay, what content will fit this content? It's content-driven. It's not music-driven. And so the content is all about po- pointing to God and getting the message very clear. Chris, there's depth to that. It's not just shallowness of, of yeah, I love Jesus. I love Jesus. I love Jesus. I... Great, you love Jesus. But listen, how does that relate to you living at day by day, week by week? And when we have a single mom with kids that are just trying to survive, what can we give that person that's truth that they can hold on to besides I love Jesus, I love Jesus. Amen? Y'all with me? And so what we want to do is have some depth to it. It needs to be organized. It needs to be steady. It's not chaotic. Not distracted. The reason why we took the order of worship out of the bulletin is so because people were actually checking off stuff. I found a bulletin with somebody crossing out the lines as we did it. Shame on us. (laughs) We shouldn't be doing that, church. We should be focused on worshiping God and not just getting through it. Amen? God's a God of order. And our worship should be orderly to second. Perfectly ordered, second, passionately zealous. Now, I'm an emotional guy. Y'all didn't notice that, right? I love to express myself. And one thing you can't fault David and Israel with is their zeal here. They are zealous for God. And zealousness is an awesome thing. I love excitement. My brother, you love to be excited too, don't you? I love to be excited. Get us two in a room. We're in, we're in trouble, man. We're like two ping pong balls in a dryer or something, right? Amen? But zealousness is only good if it's directed at God and not to ourselves. Their zealousness was really about possessing the ark instead of walking with God. Their zeal was missing a mark. How do I know that? Because proper zeal is zeal that is grounded in truth. Now, let me explain what I mean by this. Y'all remember how the ark was placed on a cart? Say, uh huh, uh huh, if you know what I'm saying. Okay. They had the ark. They had the ark, rather. The ark is a container that, that they, they, they had the, the commandments in them. And, and, and so this container was set on a cart. And they wheeled the cart along with oxen. You say, well, how did they know to do that? Because the, the ark of the covenant has rings in it with poles that are supposed to be by it, and it's supposed to be carried. In fact, if you look at the Bible and you look at Exodus 25 and Numbers 7, you'll see that they carried the Ark of the Covenant. It wasn't meant to, to sit on a cart. And you say, okay, well, wh- where did they get this idea of putting on a cart? Is it some rule that they came up with? Did David just decree that was going to happen? I'll tell you where they got it from. Listen to this. When the Philistines captured the Ark in a battle and Israel lost the, the, lost the Ark, the Philistines kept it for themselves for a short period of time. Plague started to, started to develop in the town that it was at. So so they got some people together and they said, what are we going to do with this thing? we got to get it out of here. So they went to, a, to uh, uh, basically people who were uh, practicing uh, divinity or they were practicing the, um, the art of, uh, of speaking to spirits, okay? They were diviners, if you want to call them that, magicians. And if these people, these pagans, had said to them this. Listen to this. I'm going to quote it exactly. Take the ark. 
and place it on a cart. Then have two cattle lead it away from you and eventually arrive to Benedad's house. Where did David and, and all of Israel get the idea to put it on a cart? Not from God's word, but from some witch doctor. From some pagan priest. From some idol worshiper. And they said, we're going to transport it this way because this experience somehow is better than what God gave. Their hearts weren't right. They were zealous, but they were misguided. Church, passion, and tr- without truth is useless and even dangerous and deadly. I told you, I'm an emotional guy. Now, the other night, I was at the Red Game. I was, I was, I was like, I was livid. Mary, you would have said, I, I was livid. You would have just laughed along with me. It was so bad. And at some point in the game, Forgive me for this, but at some point in the game, it was so bad when they hit a home run and they hit a grand slam off this rookie. Grand, you know what a grand slam is? Home run, four guys score. I just stopped. Nobody around except Cubs fans, okay? And my, my two sons and me. And guys, mine. And I just stopped and I looked and I went. I just, I just had to. I just had to. I love. And Nick says to me, well, you're being dramatic. <laughs> yeah, I was. Emotions are awesome. I love, I'm an emotional guy. I love emotions. But if you're going to have passion for God and God's workings in your life, you need to be passionate for God and His world. Romans 12 says, do not be conformed to the world by the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you will know what the will of God is, his good and perfect will. So let your zeal flow. Be an emotional person. Love Jesus. Praise Jesus. Do whatever God has you to do to praise him as long as it's not distracting, but make sure it's rounded, grounded and rooted in the word of God. Third. Perfectly ordered, passionately zealous, third, powerfully sacrificial. Now, David is angry. He is mad as can be. He is, he is buzzing like a bee or like a hornet or whatever it is, right? The party's over. They renamed the town because David's so mad he's in trouble. And then basically it meant uh, that uh, Uzzah's been uh, 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 troubled or uh, taken. And so David and Israel leave the Ark of the Covenant at the home of a guy named Obed-Edom. And it's just a place just west of Jerusalem. And David is not going to touch it. He's not going to go near it. He's basically angry over this. Three months pass, and he finds out, hey, you know, Obed-Edom's house is being blessed. And, and David had a period of time to reassess things, and he begins to move it. But it's different. David's focus on the Lord during this time allows him to begin to see why God is so angry. Now he knows. Listen, that worship was not about David. Worship was not about his kingdom. Worship is not about his successes, but worship is about God and God's kingdom and God's work in the world. In verse 12, take a look at your Bible. Here, take a look at it again, okay? In, in chapter 6, verse 12. You got your Bibles open? Okay. It says, and look at verse 12. David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. And so it was that when the bearers of the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed an ox and a fat lamb. Now, wait a minute. Why would God, David do something like that? Why six paces? Let me explain the way I can see it. And I didn't see this anywhere um, that was written, so it might be a little bit dangerous for me to say it, but I think, I think I'm on solid ground. They, this is what happened. They, they begin this procession now to Jerusalem. And it's a very sober, serious time, but yet it's a joyful time. And they go six paces. One, come with me. Two. And he rested and worshiped. There's a there's an element of honoring the Sabbath in this. There's an element of the perfect number of seven in this. And before David and all of Israel was going to presume upon God for that seventh step, they were going to stop and they were going to sacrifice and they were going to worship God and God alone. Isn't that a beautiful thing? 
They place the focus not on themselves but on God. Now, this is a time-consuming proposition. They had to stop, and they had to kill, and they had to sacrifice, and they had to uh, sprinkle the blood. It took time. It took money. It took effort. But they wanted to do it right. They wanted to do it God's way. You know, can you just imagine this procession? They go six steps, and they stop, and people are like, what happened, right? What happened is they focused on God. They weren't going to dare go that seventh step until the Lord was, was lifted up in praise. Later on in the procession, when it ended, he sacrificed seven bulls and rams before the Lord and also gave away raisin cakes to the people as a joyful celebration to the Lord. You say, wow, that is amazing stuff. Well, let me tell you what that is. That is powerful. It's powerful because it expresses to us that worship is supposed to be a sacrifice. It's supposed to be sacrificial. Throughout Scripture, we see the calling for the people of God to be broken before God, that our minds are sacrificially renewed, our lives are sacrificially given up to the Lord who gave it up for us. He who seeks to save his life will lose it, but he who loses his life for my sake will gain it. If anyone wants to be my disciple in Luke 9, he must what? Deny himself, take up his cross, and come follow me, Jesus said. He who has sacrificed for us deserves our sacrifice for him. That's why in Revelation 5 it says, the, holy, the, the elders and the living creatures are saying, Worthy are you, O God, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. In chapter 7 of Revelation, we see every tribe and tongue waving palm branches and saying similar things to him that God is worthy. And these are people who were giving up everything they had. They gave up their lives for Jesus. Church, our worship of the Almighty God must never be sold short. We must give it everything we have, everything we got. All of our time is valuable, but let's make sure we focus on the things that matter. I, why do I spend 10, 15, sometimes 20 hours working on a 45-minute message every week? Why? Because worship is that important. Why do we spend all this money to pay people to, to put together the worship order? Why does Harry spend hours upon hours to prepare the choir and to prepare the music and to prepare all the things we do? Because worship is supposed to be something that we lift up in our church. Why do we put all of our efforts to print these things, which cost us a certain amount of money? Why? Because worship is supposed to be the most important thing that we can do as a church. Worship is supposed to be something that we look forward to as Christians, that we come together as Christians, that we lift up as Christians. And if you're apathetic about the time you spend worshiping Jesus, then I encourage you to look at your own relationship with Jesus, because if you don't care about the time of worship, I wonder if you really care about Jesus Christ himself. Should never be an inconvenience. It's a blessed time to be with your church family. It's not something that you do when you don't have anything else to do. Church, it's also a time when we respond to God's word. We see this throughout Scripture. Every, not every time, but many times, when the word is preached, you can look at Acts chapter two. You know, Peter preached the, the sermon of the ages. Amen. He's preaching and he's telling them about themselves to, to religious Jews from all kinds of countries, and he says to them, "This Jesus, whom you crucified, let me tell you, God has made him Lord, the Messiah, the Christ." And they stopped, and they were pierced to the heart, and they said, Brothers, what shall we do? And Jesus said, uh, Jesus, Peter said, Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And these people, these people came forward, and 3,000, 3,000 came to know Jesus. There was a response to the Word of God preached. Church, don't leave. Listen, don't leave during a response time. I can't say that strong enough. That is a part of worship. You're seeing God being praised during that response time. You're seeing lives being changed. You're seeing people who are in tears, who are crying, who are lifting up the Lord, who are praying, who need others to be around them. They need your prayers. They need your encouragement. They need your strength as we walk through our journey of life together. It's powerful when we can see that happening. 
Worship is to be perfectly ordered, passionately zealous, powerfully sacrificial, and forth properly focused. David's change went from a self-focused worship and a worship of self and his accomplishments to a God-focused worship. That's the object of our worship, church. Jesus Christ. Everything is Christocentric. We don't worship us, ourselves. We don't worship the pastor. We don't worship the building. We don't worship the SBC. We don't worship the music style. We don't worship the instrumentalists. None of that. We worship Jesus. And when we worship Jesus, we just don't care about all the other stuff. We just lift him up. I don't really care what kind of worship we have. We can, we can sit and we can have no instruments at all. We can have no PowerPoint at all. We can sit and just gather together. I was at a church where we didn't have enough instrumentalists, but, so what we did, and it probably was illegal as can be. I don't know, brother. I don't think it was. But we played, we played worship music and just sang along to it. And you know what? God was honored. He was praised. Maybe we should have done something different. But, you know, what I'm saying is it doesn't matter the type and the style or whatever. It matters the hearts that are broken before God. I want our music to be culturally relevant so we can focus on Christ. But music, style, and methodology is never supposed to be the center of our worship, Jesus is. And so when we worship, we focus. It has purpose. It has purpose of evangelism and discipleship and worship and fellowship and prayer, all of these things, and be perfectly and properly focused. Let me give you a fifth one. Perfectly ordered, passionately zealous, powerfully sacrificial, properly focused, and then last, oh, I love this last one, positively joyful. Positively joyful is the fifth one. Got me up there, bro. Thank you. Take a look at what David did. Look at verse 14. You got your Bibles open? Uh-huh, uh-huh, okay. And David was dancing before the Lord with all his might. There he goes again, right? Doing a happy dance, right? He was dancing before the Lord with all of his might, and David was wearing a linen and ephod. I hope he was dancing better than I did. But he was wearing a linen ephod, and David and all the house of Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouting and the sound of a trumpet. The normal practice of dancing and worship was mostly for the women, but David didn't care about that. He put on, took off his kingly robes, put on this, this priestly garment, and he joined in with them too. And he was just boogieing on down, praising the Lord, right? In fact, the Hebrew here does not say dancing, but says twirled. You know, he's twirling, right? He was twirling before the Lord. In other words, he was dancing along with these ladies, right? I'm going to break something like once here. You know, but David was definitely doing Michael, Michael saw him with this thinky attitude she had. I'm getting too old to do that. And she saw him, and she saw David leaping. Can you imagine this guy is like, what was that, that ballet, that Russian ballet, Bristol? Bristol Cop? Yeah. He was dancing. I can never leap like he did. But, you know, he was leaping. And, and here's the thing. David was dancing and he didn't care. He didn't care what people thought. Church, I had a pastor once said, I'm the minister of clapping in the church. Right? Soon and very soon. We, and I could change beats in a heartbeat, right? And I could, I mean, I'm, I, love, I was a drummer when I was uh, in high school and in a band and a garage band, like, you know, so many kids were, and, and, and I love, I love the clap. I, I don't care, I'll put it on my hands. You don't like it? I'm sorry. It's biblical. It's in the Bible. I want men with holy hands lifted up, praising the Lord, right? Without dissension or, dissension or wrath. The point that we see here is Michael saw him and scowled. But David didn't care. Don't let the scholars and the naysayers and dampen your joy before the Lord. Look, it is just as valid to lift your hand before the Lord or clap before the Lord as it is to be silent before the Lord. If you don't want to clap, I will never make you clap. I might say, hey, let's give the Lord a hand. You don't want to do it? You want to do this? Go ahead and do that. I don't care. What I want you to do is to praise the Lord. Clapping your hands is biblical. Dancing before the Lord, yes, it's biblical. Orderly praising the Lord out loud is biblical. Michael tried to quench his spirit, and I think this is, there's something to that, where Michael represented the house of Saul, who did not have the spirit, but David had the spirit of God, and she tried to make him feel ashamed. But the truth is, nobody should ever feel ashamed of expressing their joy to the Lord. 
Not then and not now. David, on the other hand, was full of the Spirit. He, he, a Christian who is in full fellowship with God, he has the same Spirit David had. And look, if the way that a child of God who has a Holy Spirit wants to praise the Lord and lift up the Lord and, 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 and just give shout to the Lord. And they're not trying to be distracting. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that, um, that we're going to see anybody. Jason, you're not going to do any car wheels down the aisle. Amen, brother? Okay? But I'm saying if you're praising God, praise God. But don't be distracting. But if you're praising God in an orderly, zealous, sacrificial, focused, and joyful way, I say amen. Because you must have joy in whatever you do. And you have joy is to give out those cards to people. I already gave them away to the young lady who's going to hand out cards. You have joy as you do work for the Lord together. You have joy as you speak to people. As we were down at the game and we saw somebody and I and was asking for money, I stopped and I prayed with them. I gave them a dollar and prayed with them. You can do those things. And you do it with joy because you're on mission every, each and every day. And the point that we see is we have seen fulfilled what David only hoped to see and that was the gospel being fulfilled through the Messiah. So we should be joyful. Our worship must be all of those things. It must be ordered. It must be zealous. It must be sacrificial. It must be focused. It must be joyful. But most of all, it must lift up the name of Jesus Christ, the name above all names, the name by only which in that name may, we may be saved. How about you? Are you worshiping Jesus in that way? If you're not, it's time for a change. Do you know for sure if you died today, you'd go to heaven? Do you know for sure that if you were to see Jesus face to face, my friend who knows Jesus is seeing Jesus face to face, who was 54 years old and left two kids behind and, and left his wife behind and left his church behind, this friend of mine is seeing Jesus face to face. He knew where he was going when he died. And I bet you, I know this guy. I know him from my heart. He would say to you guys right now, if you don't know Jesus, you need to know Jesus. You need to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You need to realize you are a sinner, that God is God and you're not, that Jesus died for your sins, and when you call upon the name of the Lord, the Bible says you'll be saved. You need to be changed. Maybe you need to recommit your life to Him. Maybe you need to be a member of this church. Maybe you need to be baptized. Maybe you need to pray for somebody. Maybe you need to pray for something. This is a time for you to respond to the Word of God to just give him all of those things that we see behind. Father, I pray that we will indeed